Joshua, the book of Joshua, chapter 1, is going to be the text that we're going to be going off of. Joshua, chapter 1, verses 6 through 9. Joshua, chapter 1, verses 6 through 9. It says, the word of God, Joshua talking to the people. He says, Be strong and of a good courage. For unto this people shalt thou divide for an inheritance the land which I swear unto their fathers to give them, not Joshua, but God talking to Joshua. Only be thou strong and very courageous, that thou mayest observe to do according to the law which Moses my servant commanded thee. Turn not from the right hand to the left, that thou mayest prosper whithersoever thou goest. This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night, that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein. For then thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and then thou shalt have good success. Have not I commanded thee, be strong and of a good courage. Be not afraid, neither be thou dismayed, for the Lord thy God is with thee, whithersoever thou goest. And shall we pray. Dear Father God, we thank thee for sparing our lives on the side of eternity another day. And thank thee for the time that we could come to be able to worship and be together as a as a body and uh, raise our praise and worship unto thee. I pray thee, Lord, that you would please be with my mouth, be with my tongue as I bring the service and help the message to come across in the way that you need it and the way that you want it to be heard. Now pray that you would hide us behind the cross, Father, and fill us with the power, the power of the Holy Ghost of God. For we ask these things in Jesus' name and just for his sake we pray. Amen. I'd like to start off our service today by telling you the story of a man named Jim Rifle that I read about in a uh, publication put on by Focus on the Family. Jim Rifle was the president of a company called Woodcrest Management out of Dallas, Texas. Woodcrest Management owned a bunch of those strip shopping malls where they would have the different stores in the shopping malls and Woodcrest Management owned a bunch of them and uh, there was in particular a time that they had rented five stores out to a man uh, for video stores and he would have his videotapes inside of them that people could rent or buy and through the course of time this man broke his lease with Woodcrest Management and just picked up everything that he had lock stock and barrel and got out of there and there was some litigation they took him to court and as part of the terms of the settlement they got most of the inventory of what he had in those stores inside their strip malls to try to um, come up with some of the money that they had lost somewhere around fifty thousand dollars worth in that settlement and after they had gotten those tapes as part of that settlement to try to reclaim some of their losses, uh, Jim went and they had um, all of these tapes or everything were boxed up in this warehouse. And as Jim went in and he started opening up the boxes, too much to his surprise and dismay, he found out that there was some 3,500 videotapes of pornographic smut. Jim was horrified as he looked through and just found tape after tape after tape of pornographic movies. Jim had a choice that he had to make. On the one hand, he had to recover his loss for his company, but on the other hand, he did not want to have any kind of hand or part in selling or uh, or you know, letting go or running or however they would be able to recover their losses with the filth that was on those tapes. And Jim, as he was sitting here, he made a statement. He said, some people say that there's about $50,000 here. I say it's a pile of garbage. It's detrimental to the community. It dishonors our wives and daughters, our families, and our employees. But most of all, it dishonors our Lord. Jim made a decision he decided that I am going to destroy this pornography. Jim went and he held a press conference uh, there in uh, and there in Dallas, Texas. He called uh, he called the name of the press conference his community statement on decency, and he had a press conference. He released flyers, sent them out throughout the the city of Dallas there, and uh, told of everyone what he was going to do. And on November twentieth, nineteen ninety six. Jim took all 3,500 of those tapes, he lined them all up in a row, and a company uh, loaned him a 12-ton steamroller. And Jim got on top of that steamroller with his two sons, one on the one side and one on the left. And as the cameras rolled and the crowd cheered, he began to roll over and crush in those tapes with plastic flying everywhere and crushed all 3,500 of those tapes.
The crowd cheered, but there was a liberal journalist, I, I believe it was, that said, isn't what you're doing censorship? And Jim replied, no, it's citizenship, and I agree with him. Jim made this public statement. He says, we believe that pornographic videos and pornographic magazines are a trap. They lead to addiction, mental and emotional adultery. It eats the fiber away from our marriages. It eats the fiber away from our families. It destroys the community. Pornography needs to be out of our houses, out of our community, and out of our land. And I want to ask you today, do you agree with him? Amen. Jim Rifle had a difficult choice, but he made a decision to stand up for what was right. Jim had courage. What is courage? I looked up the definition of courage. There are several, but I picked up ones that I felt were uh, specifically applicable to us today in our country. The definition of courage. Courage is the choice and willingness to confront agony, pain, danger, uncertainty, or intimidation. In terms of valor, courage is bravery, especially in battle. Physical courage is bravery in the face of physical pain, hardship, even death or the threat of death. Moral courage is the ability to act rightly in the face of popular opposition, shame, scandal, or personal loss. Let me ask you a question for those of you here, those of you listening online. Do you believe that the average Christian in America today has courage? Do you believe the average Christian has courage today? The title of the message today is Having Courage When It Counts. I'm going to talk to you about courage today. And I want to make a statement to you. And I'm going to repeat that because it needs to sink in. Courage makes character visible. By the way, just on a byline, does anyone know what a good definition of character is or what character is? See, character is, for the most part, what you do when no one's looking. Character for you men when you're out of town on the road and you have to stay in that hotel room at night and you're getting ready to flip through the channels to see if you would like to partake in some of the pornographic things that I just talked about or maybe even go out on the town somewhere and into some place of ill repute when your family's not around. Character is what you do when nobody's looking. That's what and who you are when you're away from anybody who could possibly know who you are or what you stand for or what you say about yourself. And character or courage is what makes your character visible courage what makes character visible and something i want you to all know is that god holds us accountable for our character did you know that he holds us responsible for the decisions we make he holds us responsible for the acts of courage or the acts of cowardice that we have in our life and i'm here to ask you today are you courageous when it counts for the Lord. I'm assuming that if you're watching me here online that you are at least professing that you're a Christian. And my question to you is, are you in your personal life, the things you do and how people see you at work, at home, around your family, or just out on the town, are you a person who is courageous when it counts for the Lord? My suggestion to all of you listening is that families, all of you listening who have families here today, whether you're single and you are your own family, or perhaps you are a young married couple and just the two of you are a family, or perhaps it is a very large family with a couple who's been together for a very long time, that the first thing I want to share with you is that courage starts in the home. Courage starts in the home. You can say, Preacher, why do you think courage is so important today? Wouldn't you admit today when you take a look at our nation that we are in the face of a moral crisis? Wouldn't you admit that to me? Wouldn't you agree or don't you believe that our nation is facing a moral crisis? I mean, we as a country, the United States of America, are facing a moral meltdown of our culture. Our culture no longer has distinctiveness of morality in it today. And some may say, Preacher, uh, as you're starting to get off on this courage, I, I think that, that, that uh, having courage and morality isn't really that big of a deal as the things that's going on in our country right now. Or some of you may say, I think that we really have to focus on this COVID-19 pandemic. In fact, my mother-in-law, she's been locked up in her house ever since the COVID-19 pandemic even started. Uh, they had to take her out for a little bit because 
because she needed some some emergency medical care and the uh, the emergency team basically had to almost break down her door to get in to take her to the hospital while she was trying to bite them and spit in their face and telling them to get out of her house because she's so paranoid and so anxious about this COVID-19 pandemic and some of you listening I mean I work at Michael's as another job that I have and some of the the, the people especially the older community uh, come in and they are just absolutely consumed and obsessed with anxiety over this COVID-19 pandemic but my question for you in return is do you believe that the destruction of decency and the destruction of morality in the destruction of our values as a land and as our families is any less important or any more important or even maybe as important? Do you think that, that the destruction of everything that we have, that we hold, that has any kind of morale to it is any less important than a, a pandemic that's going on? Wouldn't you say that something like this is important in the lives of our families? Today, we have many broken homes in our country. Alcoholism and drunkenness are rampant. Teen sexuality is active from the time that they are basically even old enough to even begin to understand what is going on. Sexually transmitted diseases rampant. Drug addiction. Teenage suicide. I remember when... Um, you know, uh, growing up in a, in, a, in a city that wasn't so big, I had lived in a little town called Horseheads, New York. Uh, the closest city to us was a little a city named Elmira. And I would be down in the emergency room and not a whole lot happened there. Well, I remember when my daughter Jeannie was born and I was stationed in the Navy. I was down in Orlando at the time. And uh, Jeannie, our firstborn, was, was born and in the hospital. And I went stumbling off just looking around for stuff and I managed to find my way down in the emergency room. And and I was just sitting there taking a look at how much different it was in a bigger city than the way it is uh, was back in Elmira. I mean, there was people coming in. It's like watching an episode of ER, that old show that used to be on television. There's people coming in with gunshots. There was people coming in with knife stabs and, and wounds from being in knife fights and gang fights. There was people coming in who were so drugged out of their mind that their mind was just baked and they were you know clawing at their skin and almost out of control with the screaming and the raging that was going on as they were going through those signs of withdrawal and I and I might I ask you do you think that you know that is to the the moral calamity that has attacked our country do you think that's even less of a problem than something as a pandemic that's going on the moral uh, breakdown of our country in my opinion is just as devastating as a pandemic. One way or another, it will pass, but the morality of our country is going to continue to decline if you just take a look at the way it's been. My statement that I would like to make to all of you today is that we need some men and ladies with courage, and some of you teens listening and some of you singles, that we need some people of courage who will take a stand for something and not blink whenever something doesn't go exactly the way that they wanted it to go, or every, whenever something didn't go quite the way they thought it should go. I was looking up a statistic today, and surprisingly, that as of April 6, 2021, our country said that roughly two-thirds of the people in America profess to be Christians. I was absolutely shocked. Now the number of that that is Bible believing Christians as in uh, what we mean is having a biblical world view that God is in control and that he sits on the throne. That was only about 10% of the people in America. But roughly two thirds of the people in America profess to be Christians. And I didn't make that figure up. That's uh, There's 328 million people in the United States right now. That's approximately 219 million people who profess profess that Jesus Christ is their Savior and that He is the Son of God. Can you imagine what would happen if every single one of those people professing to be Christians decided to make a stand that from now on we are going to believe in the Bible, we are going to believe what the Bible says, and we are going to do what the Bible says. Don't you think that if they were to do that, that maybe it might start to turn our moral meltdown around a little bit here in our country?
I mean, I've got an awful silent congregation. Don't you think that something like that might start to have it turn around? Don't you think that? Yes. The tide would definitely turn. It would. We need courage today. Courage is the call of the hour. Courage to take a stand. And I want to uh, say to you, Mom and Dad, that Mom and Dad, if you won't take a stand, and to Grandma and Grandpa out there listening, that if you won't take a stand, then how do we expect that our kids are possibly going to take a stand in this world if Mom and Dad won't take a stand and Grandma and Grandpa won't take a stand? They won't. Our kids won't take a stand if we don't take a stand first. We, ha we can't be afraid today and be lazy. We can't afford to be lazy and be selfish and be cowardly. We have to have courage. We have to take a stand. I can liken it to someone with a heart condition. Someone who has a heart condition where their heart is just not able to um, you know, pump the blood and they have trouble and you have uh, all these bypasses and have to walk around with walkers or be in a wheelchair because the stress of walking can actually cause a heart attack. And you get to that point where, and some of you listening might even be like out there, where you're just in a position where your heart is not physically able to take care of your body the way that the body needs to be taken care of. And that is the condition that we have here in America. I believe the problem with most Bible-believing Christians today is that we have a heart problem. The heart isn't strong enough to move our feet to get us to make a stand. And the sad testament about American Christianity in our land today is that we have something I'm going to call convictionless Christianity. Convictionless Christianity. We don't have the courage to say no to things that are wrong. Moms and dads, many of you out there don't have courage to say no to your teens. I mean, how many of you listening out there are parents of a teenager? I, I do have... Uh, I still are still in the home. I have at least one teenager that hasn't grown up and moved out. Some of you out there might have teenagers. But as you sit and raise your kids, some of you, some of you, what is the standard on which you are raising your kids? Do you have the courage to tell your kid no when they're crossing a boundary that they shouldn't be crossing? Some of you perhaps might even be looking at your teen right now to see if you can get permission to raise your hand to let me know that you have a teenager. It's one of the places we've lost our courage. We've lost our courage to look our kids in the eye and say, no, you can't do that. No, you're not going to go to that place. No, you're not going to hang out with that person. No, you can't date that boy. Would any of you possibly say amen? Amen. Someone might say, well, I was able to say amen, preacher, because my teenager wasn't paying attention to me right at that moment. We ought to be ashamed of ourselves. The way we raise our kids, we don't stand up and say or do the right things. We don't teach them to stand up and do and say the right things. We don't stand up and say anything when laws are passed in our country that are completely against the Word of God, oh, that we would have the courage to say no to our kids. That we as moms and dads would have the courage to sit every day and read the Bible with our families. That we as moms and dads would have the courage today to pray with our families. And to sit with our families and just sit around in a circle and hold hands. And just raise our hands up to God and worship God with our families. Parents, today if we would have some courage that we could take a stand against the moral breakdowns in this world. And I have some questions for you. You Christians out there listening to me and your moms or dads. My questions to you are these. Will we trust God? Will we step up? Do we believe God can give the victory? Can we be Christians and be effective? Can Christian men and women like you and me, can we restore morality and goodness in our land? I believe that we can. I believe that we can do it. The question is, what will we do? 
I'm going to address five things with you. At least my plan was at the beginning of this to address five things with you today of what I consider to be courage deficiencies in our country and in our land. And I had intended after that moment to go through and talk about some things that we could do to try to overcome that courage deficiency. But as I was sitting here and preparing and studying for my notes, and I began to think that there was no possible way I would be able to get all of these things in in one service. So hopefully we're just going to be able to get through the first two tonight. Next Sunday is our Father's Day service. I had intended a different course of action, but I believe that courage is the course and the act of the hour. And so on our Father's Day service, we're going to continue talking about courage when it counts. And specifically, Dad will relate it to you about courage when it counts in the home. I'm going to address just a couple of the first five things today of what I think are reasons we have a courage deficiency in our land. And I think that if we have a problem with something, we need to try to just say, I don't think it's good enough that I can just stand up here and say that we lack courage, we have a courage deficiency in our land. I think we need to try to figure out why we have a problem why we have a courage deficiency in our land, and then try to find out a way in which we can help to solve that problem and be able to address that. Why do we have a courage deficiency? Or why, preacher, do you think we have a courage, courage deficiency? This is the first reason why. I believe that we have a courage deficiency in our land because we either don't know or don't believe the truth about God's Word. We don't know or don't believe the truth about God's Word. Courage is fueled by knowing the truth. Courage is fueled by knowing the truth. I can give you an illustration. Maybe, parents, you have some of this. Maybe, have you ever sat down with your kid and you're, you, you know, something went wrong or something's going on and you start to discuss that and maybe that turns into an argument and all of a sudden you understand that they're starting to get very bold in their answers back to you and they something, say something like, you can, you can ground me if I'm wrong. Or, or I, I bet you a hundred dollars that I'm right. Or you can you can ground me for six months if I'm wrong. And their and their voice is starting to get pretty animated and passionate about that. I would say, parents, if that happens in your home, you might want to take a step back at that moment and just think about your stand because they are acting very courageous, very bold. Why? Because they believe the truth. At least whatever they're arguing about, they believe is true, and they are standing up for it. But they got very the the point that I'm trying to make is the kids got very courageous. They got very strong. They stood their ground. What was that? What were they doing? They got courageous because they knew the truth. They knew the truth and they were not afraid to stand on that truth. When you know the truth, it gives you courage. Just like the kids that we had were standing for the truth. You stand for it. You don't like what anyone says. Even when you get in an argument, maybe with your kids, maybe with your spouse, maybe with someone at work, and the two of you are very adamant, this is the way it is. It's not going to change. And you almost get to the point of blows. Why is that? Because you know the truth. You know that you are right and they are wrong. And that gives you courage. You get to the point where you say, I don't care if all of you disagree. I know I'm right. Why would you say that unless you believed the truth about what you were saying? Going back to Joshua chapter 1, the phrase that we read here at the beginning. And uh, this is uh, right here. Um, Be strong and of a good courage. This is Joshua. We get the little Joshua plaques that you all hang up in your houses that say, Choose you this day whom you will serve, but as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Joshua is a great man of courage in the Bible. And we see here in Joshua chapter 1, as he's talking about courage, he says in verse 9, it says, Have not I commanded thee, be strong and of a good courage. It says, Be not afraid, neither be thou dismayed, for the Lord thy God is with thee, whithersoever thou goest. He says, Be strong, be courageous. And then he tells you, Don't be afraid. 
Don't be dismayed. And then he tells us why. We go back up to verse 8. It says, This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night, that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein, for then thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and then thou shalt have good success. He says, You know why you're going to be strong and have courage? It's because this book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth. This book that I'm holding right here, this shall not depart. He says, you're going to meditate therein day and night. You're going to study it, that you may observe to do all those things that are written therein. And he says that when you do that, then you will be prosperous and then you will be successful. The problem comes, the courage deficiency, when we don't do the things that he just laid out for us. The problem comes in our courage deficiency when we forget about God. We lose our spiritual footing. We have no moorings. We wander to and fro. Just convictionless Christians wandering to and fro. I mean, we don't know what the Word says. We don't stand on it. We don't have anything that we can do, uh, any kind of stand that we can make. And I believe that one of the major problems that we have in our Christian homes today is that we have nothing that we are anchored to. We have nothing that we stand upon. Christians today, we imitate what other Christians do or say. We turn to people like Joel Olstein or others like him. And they say things like we watch his show where we put his little thing on television and sit there and he's like, oh, whoever you are, just live your best life. And we get all over that and we, we decide, you know, we get excited about that and we decide to make our stand on that and we'll I'll stand on Joe Olstein. And, and then someone else comes along and, and he says something, something similar and then we, we go and we leave that and we go stand on that. And we, and, and in all of our standing as we bounce to and fro between the different things that are popular at the time or the different different TV preachers we listen to or the different things we do we find that we we don't read God's word we don't study God's word we don't dig into the word we don't build ourselves upon the word and I'm here to tell you today that one of the reasons we have a courage deficiency is we don't know or we don't believe the truth about God's word mom and dad why do we raise our kids by the Bible if it's just another book? Why not let them abuse their body? Why not let them just be sexually promiscuous? What's it matter? Why not let them just abuse their soul? Well, I'll tell you why we don't. It's because we believe the Word of God. It's because we believe in what it says. Courage is built in our lives because we know the truth about God's Word. Can I get an amen for that one? Amen. Courage is built in our lives because we know the truth about God's Word. Turn to 2 Timothy 4, chapter 4, verse 7, if you have your Bibles. And you should have your Bibles. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 7. Second Timothy chapter 4, verse 7 says this. This is uh, the last thing that, that the Apostle Paul wrote before he went on home to be with the Lord after he was beheaded in Rome. And he says in, ch in chapter 4, verse 7 of 2 Timothy, he says, I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Paul says to Timothy, he says, listen, I have, I have fought a good fight. By the way, he doesn't even say that he's won all of them, does he? He says, I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. He basically says, Timothy, I've been courageous. Timothy, I have took a stand. I have fought a good fight. He says, or, or even I've been in fights and I've fought for the Word of God, and I have fought for the stand, I have took a stand on the Word of God. He says that I have finished what God has sent me to do. And he says, I have kept my faith along the journey. People, I want to say to you today that we had better get grounded on the Word of God. 
if we're ever going to have courage, if we're ever going to take a stand, then we need to get grounded in the Word of God. And listen to me here. I don't believe that the Word of God, I don't, I don't believe the Bible contains the Word of God. I believe that it is the Word of God. Some people pick and choose what parts of the Bible. I like this part. I don't like that part. This part's bad. That part's good. I don't do that. I believe all of the Bible. I believe every bit of it from Genesis chapter 1 verse 1 to the end of Revelation chapter 22. I believe that this is the word of God. And I take my stand on that word. I want to let you know the experiences that you get Oh, that emotional high that you get from watching these TV preachers and you get all excited for a few minutes before you go out and sin again. We shouldn't be experienced believing Christians. We should be Bible believing Christians. We need to believe the Word of God. Why is it so important, preacher, that we believe the Word of God? Why is it so important? Well, if you believe the Word of God you won't have a problem with believing the six-day creation. If you believe the Word of God, you won't have a problem with the miracle of crossing the Red Sea. And I've read some things in the past where they say, you know, oh, preacher, they never went across the, the Red Sea where the column of water came in and drowned the Egyptian army. It's really, it was really just a sea of reeds. And that word was translated wrong in the Bible. It's not the Red Sea, and it's the Reed Sea. And it's really just a sea of reeds, and the water was more or less like a little puddle. And, uh, you know, and, and, and the people just went across and they crossed that sea of reeds. Listen, if the Bible said that it was the Reed Sea, I still believe it was a miracle. How do you drown the entire Egyptian army in the Reed Sea? I still think it was a miracle. So slice it either way that you want. But it doesn't say read, it says read, and I believe the Bible. I believe that there were three Hebrew children, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and I believe they survived the fiery furnace. I believe that Daniel was in the lion's den and the lions couldn't eat him. I believe that those three in the fiery furnace, that the flames couldn't touch them. I believe that Jonah was in the belly of a big fish. Why do I believe that? Because I believe the Bible. I believe the Word of God. And if you believe the Word of God, you won't have a problem believing that sexual sin is wrong and that we need to take a stand against it. If you believe the Word of God, you won't have a problem believing that God created two genders, male and female, and that you're that way through and through, and that you can't pick and choose what you want to be, and that you can change your gender identity. If you believe the Word of God, you will understand that alternative sexual lifestyles are against what God's Word commands. And what's more important, in the political arena, you will vote for people who stand on the Bible and for who stand for what it represents, and you will vote against people who want things that the Bible isn't for. If you believe the Bible, you will believe that life begins at conception. And you will agree with me that you don't have the choice to kill your children because you don't want them. If you believe the Bible, you will stand on these things. I believe these things. I rest myself in the Bible. And one of the problems today as Christians is that we either don't know or don't believe the truth about God's Word. We are not a courageous people. We don't take a stand on things because we don't know and we don't believe the truth and we don't know how to take a stand. And we don't even know how to be courageous. And being able to, and not taking a stand, that causes us to cease to have courage. I believe the Bible. I believe in the death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. I believe that. I believe the Bible. I believe that Jesus is coming to take us home in the next few minutes. Or in any case, very soon. I believe the Bible. I believe that there is a hell to shun and a heaven to gain. I believe the Bible.
I'm going to share with you an illustration, if I can remember, about this is my old church in Orlando I went to some 20 years ago. There was a woman. I'm just going to call her name Mary for the sake of the illustration. Mary had, had one of those toughest tough lives. I mean, stories of abuse growing up, abusive parents, in and out of marriages, drug addiction, drunkenness. But somewhere along the way, Mary found the Lord and she got saved. Well, during the course of life and during the course of the trials and pressures of life, uh, the pastor of the church there in Orlando, it was not me, that was the church I attended at the time, he was telling the story. The pastor got a call that Mary was in the hospital and he called up the hospital to find out where she was and found out that she was in the, uh, in the behavioral science unit and he knew that it was for mental health and that she had tried to take her own life. The pastor went down there and it took quite a bit for him to be able to get in to see Mary. But when he got in, he found out that the doctor who was treating Mary, he had, he had run into a new personally. That doctor did not believe in God. That doctor did not want the pastor to see Mary. And likewise, the pastor didn't really want the doctor seeing Mary either. But he got in there to see Mary and he began to sit down and talk to her. And... And um, Mary says, I want to tell you what the doctor said is my problem and why I wanted to commit suicide and just kind of see if this lines up with what, you're, what you uh, think that I should do. And the pastor said, okay. What did the doctor say? And the doctor said, Mary said that that doctor said that her problem and why she tried to commit her suicide was because she was so stressed out over conviction in her life. And her therapy was that he told her to take this book, this Bible, and chuck it down on the floor and stomp on it and curse God with all of her might and kick it across the room and to do that several times every single day. And by doing that, she would be able to get over this hang up on Christianity that she was going through and she would therefore want to stop taking her life. That's the kind of crazy world that we have today, folks. That's the idiosity that is coming out of our world. And if you don't know or believe the truth about God's word, you will never be courageous. We need to make a decision today. We need to make a decision that we are going to stand upon the word of God. Martin Luther was a great reformer. I'm not talking about Martin Luther King. He was a great civil rights leader. I'm talking about his namesake, Martin Luther, who started the Protestant Reformation. Martin Luther was going through, he was a Catholic priest, and he was reading his Bible one day, and he was reading in the book of Romans. And as he was reading the, in the book of Romans, the passages of the scriptures, he was realizing that the things that the church was talking and teaching did not stand up to the word of God. And in fear of death, and a fear of persecution, and a fear of excommunication, Martin Luther take a very courageous stand when he posted his 95 thesis and nailed it to the door of the, uh, nailed it onto the bishop's door there. And he decided to take a stand. And he said, "I am going to be a person of courage, and I'm going to take a stand for things that I know are right, despite whatever the consequences may be." We have a courage deficiency in our land because we as Christians do not have that kind of conviction and we will not take that stand. We don't know or we don't believe the truth about God's word. The second thing they want to say, this will be the last one that we cover today, on why we have a courage deficiency in our land is because we base our lives upon near beliefs. We base our lives upon near beliefs. I can illustrate it best. Uh, this is all um, kind of like a fish story. If any of you know uh, what a you know, fish story is, it's like, I once caught a fish this big, and if you look up in my hand, you see that this was actually the size of the fish that I caught. But I, I just want to tell my fish story. So I was sitting here fishing off of my grandparents' dock up in the, in the St. Lawrence River, and I had my fish line out there, and I had my little bobber, and I was watching my bobber, and all of a sudden my bobber starts going up and down and all over the place. I'm like, I've got it, I've got it, and I'm pulling it, and I'm pulling it, and it's hard, and I'm pulling it, and I'm pulling it, and I'm pulling it, and all of a sudden the line breaks. Ah, shoot. 
So I, I, I pull it in, I lost my line, lost my bobber, get a new bobber on there, get a new you know, hook and new worm, cast it out again. Three times that happened. And the third time I was sitting out there, I'm probably about 50, 60 feet out away from the dock. This huge, and I don't mean it like that, huge fish jumped out of the water. I don't know what kind of fish it was. It might have been a great northern pike. I personally believe it was a muskie. They have muskie up there in the St. Lawrence River. Huge fish jumped. And, and as soon as that fish jumped, I was all excited. I got to get this fish. So I'm letting it, I'm going out and reeling it in and going on. I'm trying to tire the fish out. Eventually the line broke and I didn't catch it again. Never did catch that fish. But that bobber would go out to and fro as it's going out and it would go up and down in that water. And I'm illustrating the point because that's what a lot of us Christians are like on our beliefs. We run to and fro. We bob up and down. We don't have strong beliefs that we stand upon. We don't have anything rigid that we believe. We have near beliefs. We stand on things such as opinions. And we become no longer people of courage. We become people of opinion. We see these big churches and they have all kinds of things that they try to peddle to you to try to get the people to come in. I remember the one year it was the prayer of Jabez and we've even got that book somewhere here in our library and the prayer of Jabez and, and it's basically like God bless my coast and give me this and give me that and bless me and bless me and everyone's on that and everyone's like prayer of Jabez they have stuff on you know, stuff on the radio preachers prayer, prayer of Jabez pray these prayers pray this thing and then after they get over that, they get on to the next big thing. Because the next year, a couple different books were written. And churches are all over that. And we have books like The Purpose Driven Church. And that comes out. And we're like, ah, oh, we've all got to get into that. And then we have this thing. We have to have family life centers. And so we, uh, we take our sanctuary and we're going to get rid of our pews and get some chairs in because we can fold them up and put some basketball hoops up here and there so that we can bring in the community and, and get them to shoot hoops and hopefully maybe get them to stick around for church. And we just kind of run to and fro and bob back and forth and then our opinions switch and things change and things sway but nothing's grounded we have no grounding we're too busy with activity and no time for the word of God some of you if I were to just sit you down in front of me and say, I want you to tell me why you're a Christian, explain it to me, explain to me how you got saved, explain to me how you have your sin and what you believe, you couldn't do it. There was that movie that came out a few years ago called God's Not Dead. I've often thought about this, and I'd like you to think about it with me, because if it's important for me to think about it, you should think about it too. Sounded a little arrogant. I apologize about that. So in the movie God's Not Dead, we find that uh, Kevin Sorbo is playing the atheist college professor. And in the end of the movie, he gets hit by a car in a hit and run, and he is about to die. It just so happened, by the grace of God, that there was a preacher right nearby and saw it happen. I just want to say this illustration to you. By the way, if you haven't seen that movie, go watch that. That's a great movie. It's a great movie. I just want to say this illustration. I want you all to sit here and I want you to look at me and I want you to think about this. This happens. This happens. That car has hit that man. You're standing there watching it. Think about it. You sitting here in my congregation today, you see it happen. That car has hit that man. Here he is. He's on the ground dying. He's gasping for breath. You come running over. Say you're dressed something like me here now. Say you have a little tie on that's got little crosses on it. Say you're wearing one of those Christian t-shirts that says Jesus loves you. Say, say you're doing that. And, all, and, and in that movie, that preacher came up to you and he says, Do you know the Lord? And the guy says, I'm an atheist. What do you do? I'll give it to you two ways. First one, let's just say that happens. What do you do? What are your beliefs? I mean, come on, people. Think about this. What are your beliefs? Do you know what to do? Do you know what to say? Let's just say that he's actually asking. He's like, I'm going to die. I don't want to die. Tell me about this. How do I get saved? Can you tell him? You don't have a Bible to look at, and you certainly don't have time to say, wait here, I'll go get the preacher, he'll talk to you about it. Do you know verses committed to memory that you can stand on the Word of God? Could you lead him to the Lord? He's dying. You've got minutes. You've got minutes. 
What do you say? What do you know? What do you believe? The problem is you couldn't do that. See, our faith sounds good as long as I don't have to explain it. Our faith sounds good as long as I don't have to take a stand on it. Our faith sounds good as long as we don't have to engage the enemy in warfare. That's the kind of courage I want, preacher. Just enough that I can get by and live my best life. Just a little bit of courage. That's all I want. Near beliefs. Near beliefs. Mom and Dad, do you know what happens if you have near beliefs? It means you're going to wimp out. And you're going to compromise when your kids start pushing the boundaries that you've set for them. We don't have real beliefs. We have near beliefs. Do you know what near beliefs do? Near beliefs cause us to be silent when the government passes laws legalizing same-sex marriages. And, and for those of you smug people who are like, Haha, I'm glad you mentioned that same-sex marriage preacher. It's about time you get on. Listen to me. You know, sexual sin is sexual sin no matter what it is. There's a lot of sexual immorality talked about in the Bible. There's a whole lot more about sexual immorality than there is about homosexuality. So let's just get off your high horse. I'm not preaching down against one group or up against another. You know, my job is to warn people and get the message across, no matter what it is. I love everybody. And, and, and people need Savior, no matter what their sexual immorality is. But we need to take a stand in our government. Near beliefs make it so we can't do that. Near beliefs make it so that we say nothing when they pass transgender laws that allow men to go into the bathroom right after your little girl goes into the bathroom and we can't say anything about it. Near beliefs make it so that transgender laws pass that allow men to compete in women's athletics because today I say I'm a woman and so even though I'm a man with a man's physique and a man's build I can compete in women's athletics and beat them at their races and it's okay because I feel like a woman today. Near beliefs make it so that when they pass laws that allow public schools to teach gender identity issues to confuse our children as early as kindergarten and the first grade and we say nothing and we do nothing. Why? Because we have near beliefs. You say, listen, I just don't want to say anything about it because I don't want to get backed into a corner or I, I really don't know what to say or I'm just, I'm so nervous. I just, I, I don't know how to take a stand. I don't know what to do. And what if they say something? And what if it becomes public? And what if they think I'm a hater? Near beliefs make it so that we feel those things. It's because we have near beliefs, not real beliefs, not cast in stone beliefs, that we don't have courage. Do you know what having near beliefs does? It makes it so that we are silent as a Christian when it comes to dating and marrying a non-believer. Putting your entire future and your potential kid's future in danger because you are unequally yoked together. Why is that? Because of near beliefs. We don't have cast in stone beliefs. We only believe some of it. We don't believe all of it. We have near beliefs. Near beliefs cause us to be silent when they pass laws that say that vaccinations are mandatory. Now, any of you can go onto our church's website right under our, our, um, our, our articles of faith or our statement of faith, and you can find our church's statement on our stand on vaccines. But just let me give you an illustration. Public school a few years ago, if you had a religious exemption, which means that you believe that the Word of God is against you having a vaccination, you were able to have your kids in school, and you could get an exemption for that. They've eliminated that exemption. We had our kids, our kids were in private school, and, I, and uh, the, the, the church that uh, 
with the runs the private school I was uh, sat and had a meeting with the the principal of that school who's also the pastor of that church and that pastor and I discussed the uh, the, the issue of vaccination and he said that we have um, laws that are coming through and they're making it so that in order for kids to be able to attend our school here they have to be vaccinated and our kids were not vaccinated and so I sat down with him and I shared the word of God to him do you know why that is do you know why I can do that because I stand on my beliefs and I stand upon the word of God and I have courage because of it and I can sit there and I can take verses and explain and show why we shouldn't be forced to do those things to be able to vaccinate to have our kids in schools and how it takes our freedoms away and that pastor said to me as I, he was sitting there talking to me about other preacher friends he knows that agreed with me, but he was playing it safe because he wanted to keep the government off his back as long as possible. And his statement back to me was, I'm just going to have to believe that God will protect my grandkids from a little shot in the arm. And last I knew, that was tempting the Lord. And the last I knew, Jesus said, it is written, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. Why do we do that? Why do we cower? Why do we back down? Why do we sit and say, I'm just, I'm just going to play it safe and I just keep the government off my back as long as possible. Why is that? Because we have near beliefs. We're not like Martin Luther who would post that and nail that onto the door of that, of that church knowing he could very well be put to the death for it. We don't have cast and stone beliefs. We have near beliefs. Near beliefs cost us so much. Near beliefs have caused us to embrace a new brand of Christianity today. The type of Christianity we have today, I'm going to call middle of the road Christianity. Middle of the road Christianity. By the way, Jesus said something about that, didn't he? In Revelation chapter 3, verse 15, Jesus talking to the church of the last days, he says, I know thy works that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would thou were cold or hot. So then because thou art neither cold nor hot, but are lukewarm, I will spew thee out of my mouth. Lukewarm Christianity. Middle of the road Christianity. God basically says, I want you to be on fire for me or don't have anything to do with me. But this middle of the road Christianity, this is this place where I can have some of it, but I don't have to do all of it. Let me have a little bit of Christianity. Just don't make me have to stand for anything I believe. I'll take a little bit of it. I want to get saved and go to heaven, but don't you dare ask me to do anything for it in return. Middle of the road Christianity. By the way, Satan loves middle of the road Christianity because the middle of the road Christianity shares the perfect example of someone who will not fight back. If two-thirds of our country says and professes that they are Bible-believing Christians, then why is the government doing what it's doing now? We are in the worst condition, the worst condition we have ever been in terms of morality in our country. But two-thirds of us say that we're Christians? Bull. We don't have cast and stone beliefs. We have near beliefs. Middle of the road Christianity. That's what's coming out of the world today. Luke, warm, middle of the road Christianity. The result, we have a faith, a Christian faith with little flavor, little light, few convictions. Nobody's feathers get ruffled. No stand has to be taken. We stand on sand. We have no firm footing. And what's the result? We have nothing to offer a world that is lost and dying without Jesus Christ. Because we have courageless Christianity. So today in closing, two thoughts. We have courageless Christianity today because we, one, we don't know or don't believe the truth about God's word. And number two, our lives are filled with near beliefs. Near beliefs. And I'm going to close. I had three more of these that I wanted to share, just did not have the time. 
Come back and join us for our Father's Day service next week. I'm hopefully going to be able to get in another three more of these points and start to share some things with you on how we can try to make a difference and try to have courage and bring that courage back into our homes and back into our land. And then possibly I might even go another week after that, depending on where the Lord leads us with this stand that we're taking on courage. But in closing today, I want to talk to you about finding out what you believe the Word of God says. What is your stand on believing what the Word of God says? You know, those of you who are out there thinking that you don't have to come to church to worship God, there's some very good reasons to come to church. Let's just say that you're just watching my videos and you have a church that you're active in and your church has services several different times a week. There's good reason to come to church. Do you know why it's important to come to church, mom and dad? Do you know why kids, it's important to get your kids to come to church? Because when you come to church, you hear the word of God preach to you. And when you put your kids in Sunday school, do you know what's happening? They're hearing the Word of God. And when you come to Sunday school yourself, and you sit there in that Sunday school lesson, what's happening? You are being taught the Word of God. And when you come to the morning service, you are hearing the Word of God. And if your church has an evening service, you're coming to that evening service, and you are hearing the Word of God. And if your church has a midweek service, you come to that service, and guess what? You are hearing the Word of God. And you come to those services and you are hearing the word of God and you need that to be grounded in your faith to understand and know the word of God and the next thing you have to do is you need to read the word of God if you ever 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 want to have any kind of stand of anything worth anything in your Christian life you need to read this book every day you need to pick that book up, and you need to read that Word of God. There was an evangelist by the name of Dr. Uh, I don't know if he was a doctor, but the evangelist uh, Jack Parchman. I remember hearing the story. He told me that his wife would get up in the morning, and she would read the Bible every morning. First thing she did, and she, before she went to bed, she would read that, uh, that Bible every single night. She read this Bible through twice every year. Twice every year. Do you know what happens when you put that much word of God into your life? It's going to be hard for Satan to get a foothold. You're going to have, he's going to have difficulty getting you to look at pornography. Because all you're doing is cramming the word of God on top of it. It's going to be hard to get you to go to work and cuss and swear. And go after and drink with the boys. Because you got the word of God in you. It's going to be hard for, for when, that, when that time comes up in the, in the evil story that you hear. And that cursing. For you to participate in that. Why? Because you, you have the word of God in you. And when it comes to politics. And we go to vote for the people that we need in office. Or if we're going to run for office. And we're going to take a stand. And even go to Washington. And try to make a difference. It's going to be hard for the devil to get us to slip and fall. Why? Because we've got the word of God in us. We need to take a stand on the word of God. Parents. Teens. Kids, singles, my call to you in this effort, first effort of having courage in your life and to combat the courage deficiency is to read the Word of God. Read the Word of God. Study the Word of God. Commit it to memory. Pick up your Bible and read it. Read that Word of God. Take a stand and stop the courage deficiency. Read the Word of God. We don't know or believe the truth. This will help us to know the truth. We read the Word of God. It'll help us to get over our near beliefs, our wishy-washy beliefs, our tossed to and fro beliefs, because we can take a stand and we can be grounded on the Word of God. Church, we have a courage deficiency in our land. And the call of the hour, this first step, this first two points to you to be continued next week for what we've discussed already, for what I've mentioned in this service, those of you listening to me, are you a Christian of courage? Can you take a stand? Do you know the truth. 
Or do you only know what your parents taught you? Those of you who are active in church, do you only know what the preacher says? Have you actually read it for yourself? Do you know the Bible? If you don't, let's take a stand. Let's make a decision. We have a moral meltdown in our country. If you agree with that, that our country is going to pot, would you raise your hand? Would you raise our hand? Everyone in here, raising your hand. Amen. God bless you. That's true. What's going to make the difference? What's going to change? What's going to turn the tide? The lost people out there, they're not going to make a difference. They're going to keep on taking it down the road it's been going. We have to take a stand. Christian listening at home, it's time to man up. It's time to take a stand. We need to be Christians of courage today. Everybody's head bowed and your eyes closed, no one looking around first question I have for you today for the people here in my congregation and those of you listening at home, are you saved? Everything that I'm talking about is pointless if you don't even know the Lord Jesus Christ is your Savior. So my first question to you today, if I could get by a show of hands, anyone who would raise their hand, raise it high to heaven and say, I'm a Christian, I know Jesus Christ is my Lord and Savior and I'm going to heaven. God bless you folks, I see your hands, God bless you. I love seeing that testimony and knowing that there are people going to heaven. Those of you who are out there listening online, maybe you couldn't raise your hands. Maybe you're sitting there listening to me and, you're, and it's just a testimony to God because He sees your hand and you couldn't raise your hand. That says something to me. That says that you're a person of integrity. You're honest. You could have raised your hand and fooled everybody else around you, but you didn't. You're a person of integrity. Would anyone with the raising of a hand say, I, I, I hear this message and, and I know that we have a courage deficiency in our land and, and I'd like to make a difference, but I would first like to get the Lord in my life and I would just like to, you know, I would just like to get saved. Would anyone raise their hand and say, I would like to get saved. I want to know the Lord. I see that hand. God bless you. Anyone else? I'd like to know the Lord. Would anyone say, with everybody's head and eyes, eyes closed and no one looking around, would anyone raise their hand and say, I'm not a courageous Christian. I'm a Christian. I'm saved by the grace of God. But what you've been talking about today, preacher, I don't do these things. I don't know the truth, or I don't believe it, or I don't study it, and I'm not grounded, and I could not lead that man to the Lord. And I want to make a change. Would anyone by raising your hand say, I want to be a courageous Christian. Would you pray for me, preacher? Would anyone say, I see that hand. God bless you. You can put that hand down. I see that hand. God bless you. You can put that hand down. Would anyone else? I want to be a Christian of courage. I want to make a stand. Those of you out there listening online, maybe you'd like to make a stand. Maybe you need to be a Christian of courage and you want to be a Christian of courage. I'm going to pray for you in a moment. But it's a decision between you and God. You have to make the decision. Repentance, as we talked about with salvation all the time, repentance is where you repent of your sins and place your faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ to save you. But repentance is turning from what we were doing to doing something different. And if you are a courageless, courageless, let me get that right, you have no courage, a courageless Christian, and you need to get that right, you need to repent of that. You need to say, I'm going to be a person of courage, and I am going to start reading this book, learning this book, studying this book, and getting it down, and making a change in my life, that I am going to serve the Lord, and I want to be a Christian of courage. As we pray, if anyone needs to get saved out there listening to me, and you would like to be saved, pray this prayer with me. Lord Jesus, I am a sinner, but I believe that you died on Calvary's cross to forgive me of my sins. I believe that when you shed your precious blood on that cross, that you paid the debt for my sins. Dear Lord, I now repent of my sins and ask you to come into my wicked, ungodly heart and forgive me of my sins and save me. Lord Jesus, please wash my sins away with that blood, that precious blood that was spilled on that cross for me. Dear God in heaven, please come into my heart. I repent of my sins. Save me now. In Jesus' name, amen. 
courageless Christian, you want some courage, pray this prayer with me. Lord Jesus, I have not been living my life for Jesus Christ. I'm a Christian, I know I'm going to heaven, but I have been a middle of the road, lukewarm Christian. I don't have a foundation in the Word of God. I don't stand on the things that I need to, and I want to make a change. Dear Lord Jesus, please help me to fight the devil and to get my priorities straight and help me to have some courage. Help me to be able to take a stand and make a stand. Help me be a Christian of courage. Please, Lord, empower me with this and fill me with that Holy Ghost of God that would allow me to be a Christian whose life can actually stand for and mean something. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Friend, if you prayed either of those prayers with me, first of all, if you prayed to get saved and you made that decision, contact us here at our ministry. Our website is www.swordandtrialrevivalfellowship.com. Go on to that. Contact us. We'd like to know about your decision to accept the Lord as your Savior. We'd like to get to know you better. And we'd like to encourage you in your new walk with the Lord. Christian of no courage. If you made a stand today that you want to take a stand to combat the, the depravity and the lack of morality that is going on in our country and the moral meltdown and the moral decay and you want to take a stand against that, contact us. Let us know. We want to help you on this journey, on this walk. Let's stand together. Let's take a stand and be Christians of courage together and take a stand that we are going to account for something in this godless world that is trying to get rid of Christianity at any turn. Take a stand with us today. You know, and just a thought. Just remember that the devil is going to want to take that away from you. The first thing the devil is going to say is, you don't have to do that, but just remember that it takes courage to do that because it takes courage to take a stand and it takes courage to contact us. Let's be people of courage today. Friends, thank you for joining us at the Sword and Trial Revival Fellowship. I pray that all of you will be able to stand in the gap this week. And I pray that you will be back with us next week to hear some more, perhaps the conclusion, if I don't get long-winded, on our, story, our study on courage when it counts. Having courage when it counts. Courage to stand in the gap. Courage to make a difference. May God bless you through this week, and may God keep you in His protection and care. Come back and join us next Sunday at the Sword and Trial Revival Fellowship. Take care. May God go with you. Those of you who are here with us today, thank you for coming. God bless you all.